Praise the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, as we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Boy, has it been a busy week. A week ago, yesterday, last Friday night, my wife and I were in St. Louis, Missouri. I was in concert with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. It's a huge, big orchestra and choir. And then uh, flew home to preach. You know, Pastor Harris is my friend, and that's why I am here. I don't ever leave my church. I try not to leave my church. Uh, one conference told me, pres one conference president told me that I was hogging my pulpit because I don't want, I don't like to leave my church. And uh, but your pastor is my friend, and when he called, I wanted to be here today. And then we went. Uh, my wife and I flew home. To, I preached, and then I. We flew to Washington, D.C. because I was asked to come and be a special guest of my friend, Miss Oprah Winfrey. She had uh, the unveiling of her portrait at the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery. Beautiful experience. And then we flew home. I did a funeral as pastors have to do. And then the next day, which was yesterday, we flew here to Dallas and uh, can't wait to get back home. <laughs> you know, the song you just heard, I could honestly say in my heart that if I had only one song to sing, I would want to sing a song that would let the world know how much I love Jesus. Amen. Talk about a child that do love Jesus. You're looking at one. And then I said, if I had one sermon to preach, and really that's the title of my message today, if I had one sermon to preach, what would it be? It would be the sermon I'm about to preach to you today, if I only had one sermon to preach. I think it was about 1974 when as a student at Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, I was asked to preach some of my first sermons in a little town called Bessemer, Alabama. That was almost 50 years ago. On the last Sabbath of the week of prayer, Linda, my wife, who is here with me today, she was then my girlfriend. And she came to hear me preach. Now, I want you to know Linda looked so young back then that one of the church members, one of the sisters, took a good look at her and said, Child, how old is you? Are you old enough to have a boyfriend? <laughs> And now after almost 48 years of marriage, 
I keep telling her, if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> and after almost 50 years of preaching, some might want to know, why do I still preach? And don't let anybody fool you. Preaching is hard work. You know, they taught us in the seminary that for every minute you preach, you need an hour of preparation. And it is true, absolutely true. It is not unusual for me or for your pastor. If they're preaching, if we're preaching a new sermon, it's not unusual. I think that's why they move pastors a lot. Because you don't have to preach as many new sermons when you move a lot. But when you're preaching a new sermon, it's not unusual for me to spend 40 hours in a week preparing to preach 40 minutes. It's not unusual. It takes me your whole work week, working nine to five, five days a week, to prepare one sermon. Now, not only do I preach to learn more about God's will for my own life, but I preach to help equip and prepare my family. I know my family, all their lives, they've been listening to my preaching. And I want them to be prepared for eternity. So I preach so that God's word may be for them a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. And like you, brothers and sisters, I want to see my wife and my children and my grandchildren one day standing on the sea of glass and walking on streets of gold. And my dream is that my family will be reunited in heaven. There in glory, we will all be together and live forever in heaven. It's my constant prayer that through the Holy Spirit that God will use me to open the hearts and minds of my family and my church family to the transformational power and workings of the Holy Spirit. That something I might say, by God's grace and power, something he lays on my heart to share might help someone I love be ready to see Jesus when he comes. That's why I preach. I want to see heaven for myself. And I often tell people, I've been around this world many times before. It's so funny, last night on the plane, the, the flight attendant leaned over to the gentleman across the aisle from us and said, sir, we want to thank you for your loyalty to Delta Airlines. She said, you, you, you've traveled many miles and we want to thank you. So when we got ready to leave, I asked him, I said, how many miles have you flown on Delta that they would pause to thank you like that? He said, I've flown 800 and." 43,000 miles on Delta. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I, I've flown four and a half million. <laughs> that's how many miles I've flown, four and a half million miles on Delta Airlines alone. And I said that to tell you that I've been around this world many times. And if New York and Paris and Dallas are the best this world has to offer. We are living in a fool's paradise. And I guess I might as well tell you I do have a secret dream. I guess once I tell you it won't be secret anymore. My secret dream is that one day I will be in heaven. Working on my mansion with my holy hammer. Like if there'll be something broke that needs to be fixed. And I'll hear a knock on the door, and when I open it, Jesus will be standing there, clothed in light. Oh, you're not listening to me today. Can you imagine opening your front door and Jesus is standing there? 
clothed in light, crown of glory on his head. And he'll say to me, my son, my son, I'm about to go to some parts of my universe where they've never seen a child from earth who has been redeemed. And I want you to come and go with me. Oh, and by the way, I want you to sing just before I speak. That's my dream. But as I came here to preach to you this morning, God placed this thought in my spirit that if I had only one sermon to preach, what would it be? I can tell you what it would be. It would be a sermon about the love of God. I wouldn't preach about the 2300 days. I wouldn't preach about some prophetic timeline. If I only had one sermon to preach, it would be from John 316. Perhaps the greatest foundation upon which our faith could ever be built. If there is one thing that I would preach about, it would be that God loves us. The one thing he has called us to proclaim throughout the earth, it is this, that he loves us. He loves all his children, no matter the color of the skin, no matter the language they speak, no matter the religion they practice. We are all his children, and he loves us all. One day a preacher said to some people that he had a friend who had several children, and these children grew up and began having children of their own. And after a while, he had many grandchildren. And one of his sons was having another baby, another grandchild, and that baby was born very, very late at night. And so his son decided not to disturb his father. The morning came and went, and the son forgot to call his father. And that afternoon, the father found out he had a grandchild through a church member who called on the phone to congratulate him. And so the father called his son a little upset. The son said, well, Dad, we, we apologize for not calling, but you already have so many grandchildren. We thought another grandchild would not mean that much to you. The man said to his son, yes, I have many grandchildren, but I love that new grandchild just as much as the others. And even though I have many, that does not mean that I love this child any less. Friends, sometimes we have the idea that God has so many children that surely he is not that concerned about little old me. Each and every one of us are his children and he loves us and is concerned about us as if we were his only child. Even though he has many children, this does not mean that this lessens his love for us. Our heavenly father loves us all. And often the distinctions we make between races and ethnicities, to God, none of those distinctions make a difference. Not to him. God doesn't care how well read you are. He loves us all the same. Oh, you ought to be shouting hallelujah today. He doesn't care how intelligent you are. He doesn't care how good looking you think you are or, or how good looking you think your race is. Isn't that crazy? People of one race always think their race is the most good looking. Oh, you're not listening. I'm telling the truth, am I? But guess what? That's not the way God sees it. He loves us. 
all the same. God doesn't even care how smart you think you are. He loves all his children. One of the most profound questions I ever heard was a question posed by a little girl. Her question was, God, why did you make people? Why did you make us? You know, it's a simple question, but one of the most profound questions of life. Why did you make people, God? Why did you create us? And to be sure, the answer to this question has many deep theological answers, but I believe the answer to this question could be found in one word. And that word is love. God created us to love us. He allowed you to live so he could love you. I had an aunt I had an aunt come by to see me one day. I hadn't seen her in many years. And she was walking around my house looking at all the pictures with famous people. And yes, I have in my house pictures with six. And I've been with seven of the last eight presidents of the United States either for dinner or lunch, breakfast. And she said to me, sit down. My aunt said, I want to tell you something. I sat down and she said, two years before you were born, your brother, your father, my brother, we had a sister named Pearl. And two years before you were born, Pearl died while having an abortion, getting rid of an unwanted pregnancy. And when your mother became pregnant with you out of wedlock, there were many who were urging her to do the same. But we, the sisters of your father who had been through so much pain losing our sister. We gathered around your mother. We rallied around her, said, no, we're not gonna let this happen again. And your mother's mother paid a visit to our mother, your father's mother, and they closed the door to talk about this situation. And they made a pact between themselves. They were going to pray for the life of this child. And they decided the prayer they were going to pray is, Lord, make this child's life a blessing to the world. Amen. And so when you see this life touching people all over the world, it's not me, it's, the, it's because I am an answer to two grandmothers' prayers. Amen. And God allowed me to live because he loves me. Amen. No more else than he loves everybody else. Every one of us needs to know and every one of us deserves to know the answer to this simple question. Why are you here? You know, to be really happy and fulfilled, to live a life of purpose and meaning, you've got to know the answer to this question, why you were created. And so if I had one sermon to preach, it would be to answer that question it would be the answer to that question. It was found in John 3.16. God loved you. God loves you. Desires that you not perish. 
but have everlasting life. So the answer to this question, why was I created, is really a one-word answer. We were created for love. Hear me now. If I only had one sermon to preach, it would be a sermon of a revelation of God's loving character and his character of love. And that's why I consider John 3.16 to be one of those pivotal texts in all of the Bible. It is, it is a zenith scripture that lies at the summit of the mountain of the revelation of God's character that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. If you love me, Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you notice, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Isn't that what he said? So that tells me, hallelujah, that love comes before duty. You didn't hear what I just said. Love comes before duty. That's why when we are sharing the love of God with other people, we should never lead with the commandments. Because love comes before duty. If you love me, keep my commandments. God said, so lead with love. Too often we focus on keeping the commandments that we fail to see. Did you know that the purpose of keeping the commandments is to show love to God? If you are keeping the commandments for any other reason, you're missing the point. And you're missing the boat. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Commandment keeping is to show our love for God. And we were created not only to love God, we were created, listen, 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 to be loved by God. Now, there are some people who keep the commandments because God said so. There's nothing like keeping the commandments, however, because you love him. Just because he said so, that's servitude, that's subjection. But when you keep the commandments because you love him, that's life and liberty and freedom keeping the commandments because you love God is the path of joy that's why you come to church on Sabbath with a smile on your face not because you got a break from your seven day work week but because you love him Today I have some exciting news before I leave you. Not only were you created to love God, but you were created to be loved by God. I'm going to whisper a prayer in this moment, in this sermon, that God will allow what I'm about to say to you to be as clear as you have ever heard it. If I had one sermon to preach, this is the message I would want to preach. There's a scripture, John 14, verse 21. It says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And listen carefully now, don't miss this. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And, it says, and I will love him. Did you get that? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, by my father, and I will love him. So guess what? I got exciting news. God created you to be loved by him. This is astounding. 
Oh, turn to the person next to you and say, I was created to be loved by God. I was created to be loved by God. I would be preaching this, the greatest news you could ever tell another human being. As a matter of fact, I, I only do this if the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tells you. But you can tell that to strangers too. Did you know you were created to be loved by God? Don't tell me, I want you to come to church. You were created to be loved by God. And sometimes you need to say that to yourself. Yeah, yeah, stand in front of the mirror, say to yourself, hey, you, come on now, you were created to be loved by God. Encourage yourself in the Lord, the Bible says. And when other people don't love you, that's okay. Why? Because I was created not to be loved by you. I was created to be loved by God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, Herein is love. Watch this now. Not that we love God, but he loved us. So these scriptures remind us that we were created not just to love God, but to be loved by God. And God wants us to let the whole world know that the path to happiness in this world, listen, 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 the only way to be happy in this world is to let God love you. You were created to be loved by God, but so many people, even those who believe they were created to be loved by God, don't let God love them. Oh, now stop for a moment and let this thought permeate your consciousness. I was created to be loved by God and to be loved by God, I have to let God love me. God wants you and me to understand that he created us. So if I had one sermon to preach, it would be, let God love you. In the quietness of your night season when you're lonely when you're discouraged when you're broken when you're disheartened let God love you when you're going through a difficulty when you're going through a trial open up your heart just let God love on you. Let him love you when you have anxieties and fears. Let him love you. And he will love you with a love so profound that angels will weep as they see God ministering to you. Let God love you. When you are filled with guilt and shame, let God love you. When your life is filled with remorse and regrets, let him love you. And he will love you with a love that is compassionate, that is tender. He will love you with a love that is as deep as a helpless, dependent child being loved by a mother. 
God said, I can say it. That's why he said in Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yay, yay. Anybody know the scripture? They may forget thee, but I will not forget you. In verse 16, God says, I have graven you on the palm of my hands. So before I close, every day you get up, say to yourself, I was created to be loved by God, and I am going to let God love me. I'm going to let his loving presence sweep over me, and it will brighten your day. Trust me. I don't know what you're going through, my brother, my sister. I don't know where you are in your life. You just heard the one sermon that I would preach if I could only preach one. God loves you. He created you to love you. But you're going to have to let him, let him love you. No matter what you've been through, let him love you. Will you bow your heads with me? God is in love with you. His love is wider than your imagination. His love is softer than your tenderest thought. His love is deeper than your greatest affection. Your mama may love you, your daddy may love you, your children may love you, or they may not love you. But you haven't started to live until you let God love you. I don't know who you are, but I came to proclaim a magnificent truth. God loves you. Let him love you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, this rock of faith will stand. God loves me. Not even death will erase this word from your heart. He loves me. No stain will blot this truth from your heart's memory. He loves me. And I will let him love me. In my opinion, Obedience to his will, I will let him love me. By just doing what he says, following his will and his word. Your father in heaven loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son so that you would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, thank you. I thank you. What a great God you are. I thank you. 
and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.